there, comic book friends. I'm Travis. This is another edition of Monster Comics Reviews. This is for the third week of October. So we're going to jump right into the books. First book is All-Star Western featuring Jonah Hex, issue 24. Uh, about the time I decided I was going to drop this book, I actually didn't put it on my poll when I did my comic book order last week. Um, lo and behold, an issue of this actually... I really enjoyed again. Um, of course, Hex is still set in current times. Uh, he has survived not being sent off to jail for uh, murdering the crazy guy who was running over the um, breast cancer awareness um, thing from the last issue. You know, he takes him out with a single headshot. Uh, oops, sorry, let me kick the camera. And, um, and all that. Uh, he's released by. Um, uh, Bruce Wayne's lawyer, lawyers, you know, rescue him from that. He's basically released to kind of go and do his own whatever he wants to do. Doesn't take any money. You know, Bruce Wayne wants to pay him because obviously if this guy really is the Jonah Hex or is Jonah, somebody from Jonah Hex's family, they technically do owe, you know, part of the whole Wayne casino thing back in the, um, in the Western times. Um, he's owed some money, doesn't want it, takes off with his, um, with his new hot brunette girlfriend and they take off across um, the west to find some of Hex's treasure chests that he has buried. And lo and behold, they do find one. It's full of, um, you know, Confederate gold or whatever. Um, so they're basically going to be rich. Hex picks up some new guns, some Desert Eagle semi-automatics. And, um, yeah, um, Hex has some interesting conversation about here, about how he's, he's killed lots of people. That's no big deal, but that he's really haunted by the behavior of this guy, this last guy that he had to kill, the, the senseless, you know, running people over with his car and then, and then getting out in the cell rifle and shooting people and whatnot. He's really freaking him out. He's not sure he likes this modern time stuff. Uh, the book ends with um, them going to basically the equivalent of a Burning Man um, um, event. If you don't know what Burning Man is, I'm sure you can Google it and you'll get all kinds of videos or whatever about this big giant spiritual thing that becomes like a big giant party of one sort or another um, uh, out in the desert. And uh, he's there. While he's there, he sees something that he seems odd. Uh, lo and behold, um, John Constantine is also there and is impressed that Hex can see this stuff that most people normally can't see. is these little minor demons that are siphoning off little bits of life and happiness from everybody. And um, Jonah, not Jonah, but um, John Constantine basically implies that if these little things are there, there's some bigger demon that's going to pop its head up at some point and they're going to have to deal with it. So that's what's coming next as far as that goes. Did, did enjoy this issue. I am, but I will say I am sick to death of um, uh, Muratat's art. And by this point, 24 issues in, I, I, I liked it at the beginning. I'm sick to death of all of his women looking exactly the same. As a matter of fact, in the first... Um, in the first uh, page, there's a newscaster. There are six panels, I believe. Is there six or nine panels? I believe she has two different, three different mouth shapes, and otherwise she doesn't move a muscle. She's the exact same. It's the exact same picture all the way through, uh, and all the women absolutely look exactly the same. They just color their hair different, and maybe with their hair a little different style. They're all literally have the ex exact same body type, and they've had the exact same body type for 24 issues. You know, and it's even worse in the modern time because, you know, in the old days, they at least had dresses to cover the bottom half of their body. So at least that part would change in the ruffles and stuff and, and how many petticoats they wore under their dresses would change the body shape some. You know, here, there's not even that. Um, and and, I'm, and I'm quite honestly, I'm, I'm kind of sick of it. Um, it's, an, it's an irritating thing. The people who do the covers and stuff are cool, but that's not who's doing the inside. So um, I'm kind of frustrated with that. Um, appreciate the fact that it's the same team for this long, but you know, on the book. Um, but I almost wish they would go back to the old Jonah Hex format where they would write small story arcs. They have a particular um, artist in mind. They'd write to to um, fit the bill of that um, of that artist, and then they would tell a different one when they got another artist, and a different one when they got another artist. But that's giving. Um, this creative team way too much um, room to run then and DC doesn't seem to want to do that anymore so um, to allow people to have a voice and a vision for the book really so um, I enjoyed this issue but to tell you the truth I'm still not unhappy that I have decided to um, drop that book 
Next up is the Bounce Issue 6 um, Vamp there on the cover. She normally looks all pale like that until she basically sucks the life out of somebody. And then she gets she gets all fleshy and whatnot. What happens after that, we're not sure yet. Um, of course, we got our main character. He's stuck in this kind of quasi-alternate reality. He doesn't feel right in either place. Um, he kind of forces himself back to his normal place after having a long conversation with his friend about how jacked up this place still seems and the fact that his friend's the only person who doesn't exhibit superpowers and isn't a hero in this other reality that he's kind of gone to a couple times. Um, he gets back to his own reality. Uh, the lady that helped him get to this place, she's unconscious, you know, and, and he can't wake her up, so he ends up calling the ambulances and whatnot. His brother, the district, the, the assistant DA shows up, and they, we have a conflict as far as that goes. He takes off, um, gets engaged with, um, gets into a fight with this lady, some of her minions, as she's going about some nefarious business. Um, the more interesting part of the story, we've got this scientist, Darlene is his last name, who obviously had, he was in some of the reality for some period of time back and forth and had this superhero that he was helping and stuff and that all went to disaster and that's basically why he's doing the stuff he's doing. Not probably not explaining it really well. It's still kind of an interesting comic. It's not like mind blowing or anything, but it feels like it's trying to tell its own story. Uh, the art's decent. Um, so I'm going to continue to pick it up just because um, it almost has more of a sci-fi feel to it with superheroes involved. Um, and I'm kind of digging that a little bit. Um, so I'm enjoying it. Um, it's, it's not a bad comic. I, I, I kind of like it because it has a little bit different thing to it. Uh, I mean, only it still has some of the typical stuff that superhero books tend to have in it. But it's got some other stuff going on there too. And I'm just really curious to find out what this whole alternate reality thing is and how well, what exactly Darlene is doing with it and how is he manipulating it and and what does that have to do with these you know superpower people that are coming up so I'm still really curious about all that Daredevil uh, issue 32 I haven't collected Daredevil since probably issue eight or nine I don't think um, I thought I would jump back on this looked like a fun issue to jump back on with with the monsters on the cover kind of a Halloween whatnot. Uh, the cover's the best part of the book um, for me. I didn't think this was a very great story it, or not a good jumping on point or whatever. So I think it should be interesting even if it's not a great jumping on point. I still should be invested in what's going on here. And to me, this just felt really kind of weak. It didn't feel like there was a whole lot to it. Yeah, he's got this problem with this, um, you know, ultra um, white supremacy group and, and, and they're going to send him off to Kentucky to, to, to deal with that and he gets kind of mixed up with the monsters and whatnot and and has some serious problems serious issues happen by the end of uh, of the issue um yeah i'm committed to buy the rest of them there's four more issues until this run of the thing ends but like i said this didn't impress me um even if it's in the middle of something i should still read it i don't feel lost by any means i just feel underwhelmed there there was nothing extraordinarily special no no gripping moment um no anything i mean i understand that you know we've got a character who's you know his buddy foggy has got cancer and is trying to make it through that and and there's a little bit of that there but there was nothing about this issue in particular that that made it gripping uh, and and i'm not and i'm I'm struggling to see what in this that might have been special if I had been reading it. You know, usually I can pick up on those kind of clues as to what might be a aha moment. And I don't, don't know if there was any aha moments in here. If there are, from you guys to read it all the time, you know, let me know. I've, I've watched some other people's reviews on it. They haven't really said any of those things. But just that this is a great, a great issue that goes along with a great run. Not that there's something particularly special about this issue in particular. Because I, I didn't think there was. So, but, you know... That's where I am on that. Not a popular um, opinion, I'm sure, but that's where I am on that. Um, somebody can say, point out what about it in particular was an aha moment or special about this book in particular, or not just as a run because you're in love with the run. Cool, let me know. FF issue um, 13. Uh, really enjoy this issue. There's some absolutely hilarious moments in here. Um, they end up on... on the blue spot in the moon or something like that uh, because um, 
Ant-Man has figured out all this craziness that was going on. He kind of knew about it all along. Fakes this, them going to go get the Fantastic Four. It's really a ruse for them to hide. They're hiding in the Watcher's house. They've shut up at the Watcher's house, you know, the old school Watcher's house. And, um... And they're going to hide out there. They kind of threaten him ridiculously. And, and, and there's a lot of just really funny moments in it. Um, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, I was talking with some people on Twitter. And they're like, well, you know, the, the book's fun, but it doesn't go anywhere, really. Right. It hasn't moved a whole lot as far as the story goes. But it's still just a lot of fun to read. It's a good hoot. The Mike Allard art is awesome. Uh, continues to be awesome in it, I think. There's just this funny moment where this villain is breaking into the Watcher's house because the veil has been shattered enough that he can break in. And of course, there's like split personalities of himself and, and it gets really confusing and he ends, up, he ends up screwing himself because he doesn't understand what's really going on and, um, and assumes some things because of the situations he, those different versions of himself through time have been attempting to do. They all run into the counterpart for what he thought was the issue. When in reality, all it is is the kids are out playing. They're trying to do something. They find some old technology, and this old technology is this food replicator. And the only thing the food replicator makes is bananas. So it's spitting out all these bananas, uh, which, of course, this guy's got some space monkeys with him. And, of course, that, you know, the monkeys want the bananas. And it just kind of becomes, becomes chaos and, and just a lot of fun. I have no idea where this book's going to go at, you know, how long this is going to go on. And if, if after you know, the Allards finish up the storyline that Matt had plotted out if the book's going to be done, because I know, like, um, um, She-Hulk's going to be going off into her own books. So I don't know if that's going to break the team up or if she'll be in both places or whatever, but I'm going to keep sticking with the book. It's just a lot of a fun, uh, a good laugh to read, and just very, very amusing. Uh, Justice League, issue 24, our... Some of our Forever Evil tie-in stuff. Basically, this is a giant origin story, origin story for Ultraman. Uh, it was, for me, not that enjoyable because it was just... These, these characters are boring in the fact that they are just the polar opposites of their counterparts. I mean, you know, he, all, this one's Ultraman. Ultraman basically came from his Krypton. Everything was harsh. It was, you know, survival of the fittest. It wasn't a loving, you know, gentle thing. His symbol doesn't mean hope. It's, you know, kill or be killed. You know, dog eat dog world, you know, kind of a thing. You know, his dad hates him as a baby because he's just a pathetic, you know, can't do anything for himself baby and all this crap. And, 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 it, and to me, it's, it's not interesting. It's not a whole lot. Briefly interesting when he shows up, when he, he kind of takes a side skirt to... Um, the Daily Planet, just to see what Jimmy Olsen's like. Because Jimmy Olsen's obviously something in, in his, um, in the world that Ultraman comes from. Um, and here, you know, we all know Jimmy Olsen, you know, the freckle-faced, you know, kid that's, you know, good at heart. But obviously, you know, is nobody who can contend with a Superman equivalent. Uh, and you get a little bit of Lois Lane being strong-willed and, um, uh, and stuff. That was a little bit interesting. The most exciting thing for me is, is Doom Patrol is mentioned in this. If you follow my channel or, or, or talk to me at all or whatnot, you know I'm a huge Doom Patrol fan. Um, the Volume 2 version of Doom Patrol where they read the uh, red suits and uh, Negative Woman is in the thing. Um, and, and some other people we don't ever see again. Um, not a very popular group, I don't think. Um, they're actually shown in a page. And then a later panel, other, other dialogue, they actually say... They actually mentioned the Team Doom Patrol. Uh, perfect place for an origin for them to come out of with this much chaos going on that the Doom Patrol will be created to deal with this kind of stuff. Um, but whether or not we'll actually get a real book out of it or not, that's, you know, who, who knows. I just think it's kind of smart of DC to use this kind of a thing where it encompasses the entire world to name drop, if nothing else, just to start filling their universe up. Because right now, this universe, you know, really is a huge, huge universe with a wealth, a wealth of, of, of characters and, and happenings and all that kind of stuff. But not in the current New 52. Current New 52 is actually fairly shallow uh, as far as, as, as the depth of heroes that there are. Um, so this is a way to at least start getting the names out there and some ideas about these other characters and, um, and, get, and get them in there. So that's kind of fun. Another cool thing, and there, there is one point in here where Black Adam shows up, smashes um, Ultraman around, 
uh, because of course Black Adam wants to rule the world. He doesn't want these stupid you know offworlders to rule the world. And uh, so you get a good you know a good fist to cuff briefly uh, between them, which is awesome because I love Black Adam. He's a badass character. He tries to pull the arms off of um off of um, Ultraman, which is something that we've seen Black Adam do in the past pre fifty two. He was literally ripping people in half. Of course, Ultraman, you aren't going to strip his arms in half, so that's kind of interesting. And I don't know, does Ultra, is Ultraman have the same weakness as um, Superman as far as to magic goes? That's something that's not addressed. But but as a whole, these um, crime syndicate guys are just a little too, the whole opposite thing is just a little too much for me. I, I'm not I'm not really feeling that. It's almost too, it's almost too much. Um, and speaking of that, Forever Evil tie-in, Justice League Dark. Uh, this pretty much solely has to do with um, John Constantine, and it has more to do with the fallout from um, the Trinity War than it has to do with Forever Evil. I'm trying to figure out how to hold my book. I'm not blocking my face with the light. I don't have as much light down here today. Um, but um, gorgeous, gorgeous art in it. Uh, you know, um, story somewhat interesting. Um, has some okay moments and whatnot. I just don't know where this is going to go. There's just something about it that feels a little off. Of course, new writer on it that I'm not 100% excited about. So we'll kind of see where it goes. I don't have a lot to say about this issue in particular. Um, so yeah, it was it was okay. And then finally, Young Avengers issue number 11. Uh, still a really great book, a really charming book, uh, a fun book. Serious stuff is starting to happen in, in the book. Uh, they found out that um, Teddy has been um, kidnapped, um, basically being tortured. He's being twisted into all kinds of, kinds of shape. At one point, he's a chair, uh, twisted into a chair. And um, they come up with basically a plan that entails them almost surely going to die um, trying to rescue him, but that's what they're going to do. Um, we are slowly losing Kid Loki here. Um, Wiccan casts a spell, does a ritual to try and get to try and make Loki older, so he has more power to deal with this threat of Mom and his uh, jilted lover, Loki's jilted lover, who was left at the dawn of time, um, and see where that all goes. I mean, a lot of us that read this book kind of feel like this is the writing on the wall. We're going to lose Kid Loki, which is one of the charming, fun things about the book. We're going to lose him to his own series coming up. We'll see what happens. As far as how that really works out or not, you know, I don't know. Because um, we got still have this kind of dual personality thing going on with um, with Loki anyway, where there's Loki, the body, and then there's this other spirit that's floating around, and the two of them are always arguing about stuff. So I don't know if they're one and the same, or they're a fractured piece of it, or exactly what's going on there. So, you know, we may get something else out of this. Uh, there might be a surprise. Uh, but just a really fun, I love the characters in this. I love their interaction with each other. Uh, the kind of, it, it does pulp culture in a kind of fun way that um, Kieran Gilligan and um, and uh, McKeevy um, do just a great job of and um, so really really enjoying the, the, the book still um, excited to see where it goes this is probably my favorite uh, Marvel book um, still at this point um, just love the, uh, the, the superheroes that are in it they're just lots of fun and I hope that with the stuff that's going on with Loki and whatnot, that doesn't shut this book down. Um, because I, th I think it'll be funny without Loki. Loki is a great part of it. But I hope that doesn't mean we're going to lose, you know, like the Ms. America and um, the Kate Bishop Hawkeye and, and Novar and some of the other fun people that are in this group. All right. So that's it for this week. Um, be back next week with more comics. Have a great one, everybody.